Well, good morning. We're going to get started. It's a little bit past uh, 10 30. Uh, thank you all for uh, attending our presentation. Uh, my name is Jeremy Frumkin. I'm with the University of Arizona, and I'll be presenting along with uh, Oren Bader Ray from Ex Libris and Pascal Calerico from the University of Waterloo on what we think is a pretty exciting um, and unique uh, approach to uh, providing recognition for libraries and the roles we play and the value we add back to our user communities. Um, so our title of our presentation is called Library Brand Recognition, Generating Visibility in the Virtual Age. And we're going to divide this presentation up into uh, three components. I'm going to talk about a little bit about the history of where this uh, idea and approach uh, generated from. Um, uh, Oren's going to step in and talk about some of the implementation. And then Pascal's going to talk about uh, the pilot that we've been running um, and some of the early results from that pilot. So to frame this discussion, um, I want to bring us back to uh, about 2010, um, the time known as uh, when there was the Great Recession was officially recognized, um, though the, academic, uh, the economic downturn began um, in late 2007. But by 2010, uh, academic libraries, and indeed academia as a whole, were facing great challenges um, in these difficult economic conditions. A number of uh, reports pertaining to these challenges in academic libraries were published in 2010. Uh, two of note uh, were uh, one called the Research Information Network Report on Challenges for Academic Libraries in Difficult Economic Times, and the Association of College and Research Libraries Report of the Value of Academic Libraries, a Comprehensive Research Review and Report. Findings from this report were presented actually at CNI by Marion Ellen Davis in the fall 2010 CNI member meeting, um, and that was a session that I and my colleague uh, uh, from Oregon State, Terry Reese, at the t uh, attended. Um, the presentation that uh, Mary Ellen gave was uh, especially compelling, as in the case of the University of Arizona, uh, we were in the process of adopting a financial model called RCM, which is a uh, responsibility-centered management. In this model, colleges and units um, are often taxed for centrally supported services, thereby putting the value they provide back to units under closer scrutiny. So in this case, the library uh, you know, is looked at as a tax uh, to the unit. The unit gets all the money, and then they get their library tax, as well as their IT tax, and other centrally provided services. Um, so it was increasingly important for us at the University of Arizona to understand how we could better relate our value back to these units, and in fact, uh, to institutional success factors. And so this kind of this report and some of its findings were high on our, our radar, and actually these types of uh, uh, thoughts still are. So the ACR report concentrated on a, a number of recommended actions that libraries could take. Among these, things like uh, record and increase library impact on student enrollment, link libraries to improve student retention and graduation rates, enhance library contributions to student job success, track library influences on increased student achievement, demonstrate and develop library impact on student learning, among many others. These are just some of those. In general, uh, the report recommended uh, these types of actions, but also a lot of actions that sort of demonstrate, track, record the contributions and assessment of what libraries provide back to their institutions. So to me, the gist I took from this report and the presentation was that the academic, academic libraries really needed to significantly increase our efforts in demonstrating the value of the existing and emerging services we're providing to back to our institutions, um, and that we needed to do it in a way that was hard for folks not to really rela you know, relate or hard to them not to recognize you know, the return on the investment that the institutions were providing back to the libraries. So following uh, the presentation and the report, uh, Terry and I got to uh, conversing uh, about some of the findings and some of the, uh, some of the ideas presented in the report. And we began discussing in more general terms how we might relate uh, better the value of our libraries, not just to VIP stakeholders, such as presidents, provosts, et cetera, but to the communities we serve at large. Again, in the context of the University of Arizona, we were looking at an increased need to become more visible across campus due to our institution's new budgeting uh, model. Um, additionally, uh, we were beginning to rely a lot more heavily on student fee funding for a, for a great percentage of our budget. Our student fee uh, was increased significantly. I think it started at somewhere around $10 a year, and, and right now it's at $200 a year per student. So that's a fairly significant chunk of uh, a change there. That's coming into our budget to offset some budget cuts that we were suffering from, from at the time. Uh, 
So um, our ability to relate our value with a variety of communities and stakeholders is becoming more important than ever. During the course of our discussion, we recognized that one of our biggest challenges was in relating our role in providing access to electronic resources, i.e. the fact that when a user downloads a licensed article, be it from Google Scholar or from the library's own discovery tools, it was not often apparent that the library played a key role in acquiring and delivering that resource. In fact, we were better in our role, the better we were in our role in brokering access to electronic resources such as articles and ebooks, the more seamless uh, this was to the user, and therefore the more invisible our role actually, you know, the invisible we were in that role. Um, sure, we can often brand a splash page or, or, uh, or provide native or provide some um, branding on a na native licensed database. And while the user in the process of discovering content, uh, we may garner some recognition. Um, however, if the user is discovering resources through Google Scholar, Microsoft Academic Search, or another external discovery tool, there's little control or ability for us to relate uh, our value or brand back to the user. Additionally, um, in any of these scenarios, recognition is quite ephemeral. There is little, if any, persistence of that recognition. You know, I'll just add to this, too, that you know, using tools like Mendeley or, or newer uh, research support tools, you know, while you may set up access through your library through those tools, that even makes it less visible to the user th through the course of their research process. So this is a really important challenge for us in terms of relating our value. So what if libraries were able to actually brand the information resources themselves? Uh, this really struck a tone with Terry and I as we talked about this. Let's see if libraries could brand articles and electronic resources. This could be, uh, that could be by applying the branding in the margins of the paper, or perhaps better just by attaching a cover sheet to a PDF much in a similar manner to how we often put a cover sheet on top of a physical interlibrary loan. So by branding the resources themselves, libraries would have the ability to gain a stickier type of visibility while not getting in the way of the researcher. The branding sticks with the resource, so if a user is reading it on their desktop, their laptop, their tablet, their phone, et cetera, the branding is there. It doesn't just cause the user to take any additional steps or effort, just as placing a cover sheet on an ILL has minimal impact. And in fact, if we were successful in implementing a branding approach, we could also open the door to adding user value through um, a similar process. One could imagine that a full citation for an article could be provided on the cover sheet as part of a branding service, for instance. It also might allow a library to relate a specific amount of value for that article that the user has just acquired. You know, one study I've seen has put the commercial cost of an average academic article at around $19. Um, at the University of Arizona, where we do have a $200 per year student fee, it would be fantastic for us if a student who has just right-clicked and downloaded 20 articles for uh, you know, an assignment that's due that next day, um, you know, and uh, that's due in the morning, could also recognize that the library saved them $400 by providing those articles. You know, that really, you know, $400 worth of articles, $200 student fee, that value proposition would be one we'd love to make back to our students. This is directly recognized value. So finally, before I hand this off to Oren, the key here is that this approach, this idea, looks at how libraries can increase their value recognition in their role as provisioner or broker of information resources. This is something we've done traditionally with traditional resources, book plates, ILL, cover sheets, et cetera but an area that I believe we have the ability to, we have underleveraged with electronic resources and we have the ability to, to really leverage more greatly. All right, uh, thanks, uh, Jeremy. Um, so my name is Oren Bedari. Um, I'm from Ex Libris, um, and just as um, in ways of uh, background and context, um, so we work with um, um, academic research, national libraries around the world in three main realms, uh, discovery and delivery of scholarly library and scholarly content, uh, management of um, library processes, end-to-end -end library processes, as well as long-term digital preservation. and. Um, a few years ago, um, we took a hard look at approaches to library services. Um, you know, a lot of that is, is in, in relation and as a result of um, you know, the, the, the major dramatic changes in scholarly production and communication, uh, user perceptions, both, both um, students and faculty, etc. 
Um, and uh, we came up um, and uh, delivered a um, new framework for library services uh, that is really based on um, um, a comprehensive, providing a comprehensive approach uh, to both uh, discovery and delivery and management of all types of scholarly content, so including um, electronic in the mix as well as local digital repositories. Um, and, the, and the real goal here is, is twofold. Um, one, to make um, you know, the common stuff uh, much easier, um, quicker for libraries and library uh, users um, to use. Um, so really um, make it possible for libraries to work at scale in an efficient way. Um, and paired with that is also uh, help libraries kind of shift the attention to focus on more of the unique um, and arguably um, you know, important um, um, processes, uh, projects, uh, content uh, produced in their institution. So it's kind of the combination of the two, um, you know, efficiencies at scale uh, and the introduction of new services in, in support of, you know, local activities in the realm of research and teaching that we believe is, um, makes it possible for libraries to um, demonstrate more value to their institution. Um, but I think a, a prerequisite to demonstrating value is being recognized for, for services that the library does. Um, and um, to gain that recognition, um, I think Jeremy uh, pointed out that um, there's a little bit of a contradiction here, or conflict. Um, you know, we want to be involved, we want to produce more, more value, we want to, to, to have greater role, uh, certainly in the provision and inf information, uh, but we really need to do it in a way that doesn't get in the way of the user. Um, so it's really a lot of that is about being an invisible facilitator of information. Um, so obviously in this, this realm where you want to be invisible yet um, um, demonstrate your value, um, you know, the recognition of, uh, for services becomes even more important and that's why um, you know, when talking to uh, Jeremy and Terry we got really um, interested in this uh, project. So let me um, show you um, an example of what, what, what it does. What, what does branding mean? Um, so let's assume, um, you know, suppose I'm a student at um, School of Engineering at uh, Waterloo uh, University. Um, you know, I use, um, as uh, many um, of our users we know, use um, a, a wide variety of tools to discover uh, co content, including Google Scholar. Um, so I. Um, you know, go to Google Scholar, I search for um, um, automotive um, uh, wireless, um, this is my search term, I get my result lists, um, and um, you know, I pick um, one of those results, you see the third result there uh, at the bottom highlighted, uh, I click on that result, uh, what I get here, um, as an example, um, I get to the publisher's um, um, platform, uh, in this case, uh, Springer Link. Um, I look at the, um, the splash page, I decide that this is what I want, um, and I have an option here to download the PDF, but note that there's nothing on this splash page, um, and this is true for many other examples, that actually identifies this service with anything um, to do with Waterloo. And particularly since I started with Google Scholar, uh, most user won't make that association of uh, the provisioning of this article with any service of Waterloo um, or Waterloo libraries. And indeed, uh, when I click on the download the PDF, um, I get the PDF um, in my browser or my um, Acrobat reader, um, and you know, I go and do my thing uh, with the article. Uh, this is the current workflow. Um, so what we did is um, basically assume the very same workflow, so no change in, in the understanding of the user behavior. I'm still the same student of engineering, um, go to Google Scholar, execute the same search, um, get the same result lists, um, click on the third result and get to um, the um, slash page um, of um, Springer Link. Um, still no um, sign of the fact that Waterloo had anything to do with this. But what happens now is that uh, what I get when I open the PDF, um, I get um, a cover page. 
And this is a cover page that is designed and controlled by uh, Waterloo um, in this case. Um, they put you know, whatever information they, they, they want to put here, um, including um, the information that this article is being provided uh, to you, the user, by um, the University of Waterloo uh, Libraries. Uh, so this is, in essence, uh, what, what we're talking about. As I say, this is customizable um, under the control of the institution. Um, so another example is San Diego um, um, State uh, University. Um, and, um, you know, they designed their own um, cover page um, that tells their users who paid for the article and uh, where they can get more help if needed, etc. Uh, we'll talk more about that uh, momentarily. Um, and then, of course, comes the article. So, so the article remains intact. It's just a cover page. Um, this is basically it. Um, just say a few words about you know, the, the, the architecture of, of the solution, what, what's really important to point out is that it is entirely built uh, on the basis of um, uh, current infrastructures that uh, most all institutions use today. And um, it's built on the notion of um, the fact that um, many institutions, in fact most institutions, use a proxy server. Um, so when end users um, um, approach and, 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 and connect um, um, to um, content providers' um, site, um, it goes through a proxy. Um, so building on that infrastructure, uh, what we did is just a simple thing, um, really, and that is that um, you know the interaction with a proxy server remains the same, uh, but there is a condition here that, um, and, and all this can be controlled by IP address ranges, so um, this can happen only to a subgroup of users, uh, which was very important when we conducted the pilot, uh, because we didn't want to impact the whole um, user community wanted to, to focus on, on, on a small group of testers. Um, so it can be uh, restricted to based on IP address ranges. It can also be um, um, restricted based on target um, uh, URLs, um, namely um, you know, create subset of targets um, where this approach is being applied. Um, and within those restrictions, um, if the returned um, material contains a PDF, that PDF can be triggered uh, for branding. So this is basically the, the, um, uh, the, the information flow and the architecture of the solution totally built on, on existing uh, infrastructure. Um, the methodology um, that we followed in building this, this option um, is um, we spent uh, quite a bit of time in the lab um, you know, doing the research and development, the necessary work there, um, as well as testing. And then um, about a couple of months ago, we started uh, field testing with a couple of partners. Uh, we started um, what we call pilot one with two, and uh, we're just about to finalize this stage and start um, the second phase of pilots uh, with anywhere between five to ten institutions. So as a side, if any of you or your institution would be interested, uh, please come talk to us. Um, we'd be happy to, to tell you more about the, the opportunity to participate in the pilot. Um, you know, generally speaking, each, each um, um, such um, uh, implementation includes three um, stages, implementation of the technical solution, um, and uh, working with, with the institution in, in bringing up the, the branding uh, component and integrating it into their infrastructure. Um, then we start gathering data. There is a lot of data that is being gathered, and Pascal will talk more about that, as well as the user testing um, stage. Um, and again, Pascal will talk more about that. So. Um, we worked, as I said, with two partners um, in, in our first pilot stage, um, San Diego State University um, and um, University of Waterloo. And um, I'd like to hand it over to Pascal, who will tell you more about their experience. Thanks, Soren. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how this project came to us and uh, share some early results um, from doing this uh, co-development work. I was really interested in um, uh, working with Ex Libris on this 
Um, we've been a long time Ex Libris um, uh, site, and I've been involved with the Ex Libris community uh, of uh, customers for a long time. But I'd never been um, worked with a, uh, you know, part of a, a project that actually looked at the needs for um, uh, developing a, a new project from kind of the idea stage through prototyping and uh, seeing what it was actually like. So um, I presented this to our librarians and um, they were also kind of interested in this. So I'll tell you a little bit about um, the University of Waterloo and the um, environment in which uh, we are in. We are in a layer of um, a number of consortiums, which is a little bit different than what typ uh, typically one finds um, here in the United States. And that impacts um, how the service provision kind of flows throughout this. So some of the, the things that um, uh, we had to take kind of special attention to. Um, We'll talk a little bit about the, the branding pilot itself. Um, what was involved, um, how long was this? It was a fairly short project. And um, then give you some uh, focus group comments from uh, graduate students and faculty um, that we recruited. So uh, Waterloo um, is very much a uh, science and technology um, University. Um, uh, they're very proud about uh, things like entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, Bill Gates uh, said a few years ago that um, he has the most software engineers working at Microsoft sourced from University of Waterloo. So um, partnering with a vendor was very um, consonant with the spirit of the university. This is something that um, is encouraged at Waterloo, experimentation and, and looking at um, different and new ways to do things. Um, we have uh, about 34,000 students, most of them undergraduates. It's not really a residential campus, although uh, many students um, live in kind of the surrounding area to campus. So most of the use of um, electronic resources at Waterloo um, is through proxy access from uh, their apartment buildings, their private residences uh, surrounding campus. And then when they're on campus, um, most students bring their own uh, device uh, with them. So whether that's a tablet or a, a laptop, um, so they're using the, the campus wireless network. Um, the um, Waterloo is uh, a member of um, a local consortium, um, the Tri-University Group. And so when we initially talked about this uh, with our other two partners, University of Guelph and Wilfrid Laurier University, we were thinking it would be kind of interesting to um, uh, have this in three different library contexts, but uh, within the same consortium. Um, they were both going through um, pretty intensive web redesign projects, and it was simply a matter that they couldn't kind of insert this into uh, uh, a short time frame to participate. Um, but so we have about 77,000 students within this consortium and we provide a lot of shared services and uh, shared remote storage for collections. Um, and we use uh, Voyager, Primo, um, and SFX. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit about um, what that looks like um, in terms of how it actually uh, provides the service um, on uh, campus. So then within the provincial um, uh, sphere, we're also connected and we get um, services through a shared um, service called Ocal Scholars Portal. And each of the 21 universities in Ontario um, feeds money to Scholars Portal and they provide uh, shared services to all of those students and faculty um, at those 21 institutions. So um, 
someone had the great foresight years ago to uh, write the licenses such that when Scholars Portal um, purchases electronic resources on behalf of the students and faculty and, and the public of Ontario, um, Scholars Portal actually um, owns those materials. So they've carried that on throughout the years and they host locally um, about three and a half million uh, articles now, scholarly journal articles, and a growing number of ebooks. And so this was also important in um, how uh, the service looked um, on our end. Um, and they've also uh, rolled out um, a variety of other services here that you can see. Then within the national um, viewpoint, there's a national site licensing initiative which has been around for a little over 10 years now, which takes the core scholarly resources that everybody relies on. These are the bread and butter, um, Elsevier, Wiley, Oxford, et cetera, um, and negotiates all of those things at the national level, um, which has resulted in um, significant cost savings um, over uh, uh, the long time that that's been in place. Um, so it's an information rich environment and it's complex because we have multiple service providers. Um, we have things locally, we have things that are sourced provincially and then we have um, content that's uh, nationally licensed. Um, the project kicked off really in late August and we've, um, we're at the point now where we're still getting back some focus group results. So one consideration if you want to do a project like this is you need to carve out some time and, and be agile within your organization uh, to be able to do this. Um, the team that worked on this um, were two or three people from our uh, digital initiatives department. Uh, and then we had four library liaisons and myself, and then a project manager at Ex Libris, and Warren would sometimes join us on uh, weekly calls that we set up. Um, so the things that we were responsible for was designing that uh, PDF page, that uh, initial page that you saw. Um, and in Ontario, we have um, some accessibility guidelines, which made this um, just, uh, a, a, well, there was a few extra steps of checking to ensure that that PDF page was actually met the accessibility guidelines that we have in the province. Um, and then there was configuring both the open URL resolver, which in our case was uh, SFX, and um, any proxy services. We use Easy Proxy um, with a number of uh, providers. Uh, we we selected about eight providers um, to initially work with where we could get um, a fair amount of electronic content from a broad um, area of subject disciplines. Uh, so it was like Oxford and Wiley and uh, the JSTOR uh, journals and a few others. Um, then we did some internal testing initially on staff workstations. So we knew the IP addresses of the staff workstations and we limited it to, uh, to those. We wanted to ensure that network latency wasn't an, <coughs> an issue and also that uh, things were being branded consistently um, as, as expected. Um, and then we deployed these initially to all of the public workstations um, within the library. Um, and also deployed them to our set of uh, focus group members um, who were located in um, uh, four different departments, electrical engineering, philosophy, psychology, and public health. So that was kind of a nice mix of um, different subject disciplines and we thought uh, it would be interesting to see uh, what people thought of these coming from uh, different disciplines. We worked with Ex Libris to also harvest the um, 
statistics coming out of the MySQL database in SFX so that we could track progress as we went along um, looking at um, how many pages were being presented for <coughs> branding versus how many pages were, um, yeah, if you could just pass over the water, thanks. How many pages were being served up without branding? So we could get a sense of how much of uh, the uh, services were being um, utilized. And there were some um, differences between what we saw at Waterloo and, um, uh, what's it, San Diego State? Um, San Diego State has a much more um, standard, uh, kind of simplified environment, and everything was being branded. Um, we were working with a subset of publishers, and um, because of the way our SFX is set up, um, all of the uh, article content that was coming through Scholars Portal, that provincial consortia, was not being branded. And we have our Open URL Resolver configured to preference Scholars Portal content. So when users click the first link on the Open URL Resolver um, uh, page, it goes to Scholars Portal, and those things weren't being branded. So um, it was only if um, users uh, actually clicked on um, the Wiley title, for example. But you can get some nice statistics out of this and, and track um, how things are proceeding uh, from there. So if we look at how this kind of played out at Waterloo, if a user starts from our home page, um, we have Primo embedded on the home page there and um, does their search in there, um, goes to Primo, and uh, finding the same article here, um, one clicks through and gets the SFX menu, and here you see the various choices that uh, one would have um, in where you could source that particular article from, and you click through to the publisher site again. This is the, the Springer, um, link uh, as well, and then uh, seeing that first page um, with the cover page. So initially, we wanted to gather uh, feedback from two groups. We wanted a, uh, a cohort that um, was not aware of the pilot and a cohort that was aware of the pilot and see uh, if there was any difference in uh, what people were saying um, the uh, undergraduates and staff, um, we intended to get feedback um, from the library workstation, so using um, the resources within the library. Um, and we had a, a link to a survey on that cover page. Um, we ran about a week's worth of results, and people were simply not clicking on that survey. They were just clicking through and going through to the content that they wanted. Um, so we had a discussion around this, and we decided that what we would do is really focus on uh, the focus groups from the graduate students and the faculty um, to get more of uh, a sense of uh, what they thought um, the utility of this was. Um, so as I said, we worked with uh, four different departments, and we uh, used our liaison librarians to solicit volunteers from those departments to participate. Um, some of the comments that we got, um, I would say that, and these are kind of representative comments, the faculty, uh, generally speaking, um, were more uh, positive in thinking that um, the branding service was, was useful to them from their perspective. Um, with graduate students, um, generally speaking again, um, they uh, sometimes found it an impediment. If they wanted to print out the article, they would generally have to print out a custom page range, for example, um, to skip that first page. Um, but uh, you see some of the, the comments here um, 
uh, echoing that notion of starting out at, at Google Scholar and um, not really seeing where the article actually comes from. So for the uninformed user, the notion that the information is just simply out there and is freely available um, could be something that, that they would think of. So in this case, library branding uh, really does work. Um, the, uh, some of the graduate students here um, also noted that there actually is some branding around this in, in Waterloo's case. So when you hit the SFX menu, um, you actually do see that it's um, uh, University of Waterloo Library. Um, so they thought in some senses that the, the branding page um, was less useful because they already knew that it was being sourced from the library. Um, a lot of students wanted, instead of a whole page, they would have preferred just either a footer or a header or perhaps something down the side. And um, that becomes a, a, a much more complex situation to take a, an existing PDF and insert um, some text uh, because of the variability of how much margin space one might have um, in, in journals. So it's a good idea, but actually carrying that out um, might be a, a lot um, more difficult. Um, a few comments on working with um, Ex Libris or really any other vendor um, that you, you might want to do from, from your library and some of the things that um, just generally to kind of think of. The first thing is that it's a development project. Things will change and um, you need to be um, ready and agile to um, change plans as uh, things come up, and, and those are normal. This is uh, an inquiry into developing a new service, and you're really trying to see, during the prototyping, what's the best way to do something? And uh, that may change and evolve, and it probably will over time as you do that. But really, this is an opportunity for the library to work um, with uh, your vendor to design a new service and you can make sure that there's a lot of user service orientation to that. Um, so there's a great opportunity in doing these things. Technical staff enjoy these things because it's something creative and it's development work and um, it's something they don't normally do. So our uh, technical folks uh, really enjoyed um, working with Ex Libris, despite things like, okay, can we uh, change that SFX configuration again, try this out, reboot the server, you know. Um, they uh, really enjoyed um, doing this. And when you're working with a vendor, um, there's going to be a lot of staff um, effort involved. So think about what you would like um, the library to get out of it and make sure you uh, talk about that um, with the vendor that you work with. Some of the technical things that we ran into which were unexpected I thought I'd mention. There's actually still a lot of diversity across our campus which I was really surprised at with uh, static addresses and dynamic IP addresses. Um, my experience and my thinking um, had been, well, everybody has probably moved to dynamic IP, um, except in a few cases where, you know, machines are accessing a few privileged servers and, and those are done by static IP addresses. Um, but it really wasn't the case and it really uh, depended department by department um, who had uh, static and um, dynamic IPs. This was important because we needed to know the IP addresses of our focus group members so that we could um, show the branded pages just to their workstations and not everybody in, in the department, for example. Um, 
the fact that the scholars portal resources wouldn't be branded um, we didn't think of that um, going in and uh, one of our first weeks um, in thinking uh, we were just looking at the statistics and wondering why the statistics were um, uh, a lot lower um, unexpectedly so and then we realized well gee the uh, scholars portal link is being preferenced and people are probably uh, clicking on that to a um, much greater degree than going down to the second or third provider. Um, we also had our SFX hosted at Scholars Portal at the University of Toronto. So we had to work with Scholars Portal staff to get access to a test uh, instance of SFX that we could use there. They're very accommodating and helpful, but it, it was one extra uh, piece that we needed to, uh, to work with. And then there's also some variability in how one sets up the uh, proxy uh, stanzas uh, with regards to uh, wild cards for the domain names. Um, and perhaps I'll uh, hand it back over to uh, Jeremy to uh, talk about um, the summary and, and thoughts on future work. Thanks. So, so thanks, Pascal. So just to summarize, um, this is an effort that I think that uh, we're all very excited about to see um, how this could help libraries relate back their value to uh, key stakeholders, decision makers, funders, um, whether those funders are uh, upper administrators, deans, um, or just the average user of the library, whether it's an undergraduate, graduate, or faculty member. We were really early in the testing process. I think we've got some really good data. Um, and uh, we're really, you know, we're just very excited about it. So we'd like to uh, sort of end at this point and, and take your questions.